Hey, it's Brett, and this is Brett and some books. Today we are starting Boxcar Bertha by, uh, as told to Dr. Ben L. Reitman, with an introduction by Kathy Acker. This was published, copyrighted, in 1988, and the introduction. In 1894, General Jacob S. Coxey led the famous Coxey Army March into Washington, D.C., and soon after that, Dr. James Eads Howe, the millionaire hobo, organized hobo colleges all over America. By the 1930s, according to Boxcar Bertha, there were between 500,000 and 2 million hobos in the United States, at least a tenth of whom were women. Hobos, unattached men and women who were looking for work, bums, on the other hand, were addicted to drugs and drink. Men and women became hobos for all sorts of reasons, desire to travel and have adventures, escape from bourgeois rules, but most of all, because of the lack of jobs. A hobo, living a precarious existence, hated the society through which he or she could travel but which he or she could not ever flee. Nowhere to run in huge America. To hell with such a society, Andrew Nelson said to Boxcar as they both looked at statistics on criminals, prostitutes, and hobos. We must somehow destroy it if we have to be thieves, crooks, weaklings, and slaves just to exist. Who can remain quiet and peace-loving and be content just to vote? Nelson continued, even now in these deadly days of depression, all we have out of the chaos is the rich growing richer and the more powerful and more arrogant and the bulk of the poor growing more submissive and adapting themselves by force to a lower scale of living. What is happening in the United States in 1988 and what is happening in the United States in 2023? The only hope I see left, Nelson continued, is the refusal of the transient type to take what is given them. You and your kind are the only ones left with the real sense of freedom in America. Yesterday, hobos. Today, the most anarchist or hardcore of the rock and roll bands. Boxcar Bertha's maternal grandfather was Moses Thompson, an abolitionist who worked with John Brown. He was also one of the earliest proponents in the USA of emancipation for women, of platforms such as free love, freedom from marriage, and birth control. Abolitionism, feminism, utopianism, vegetarianism, etc. The secret history of the United States, the one that doesn't get into the children's history books, is that of populism. In Europe, the left, historically has centered around parties, for instance, the Communist Party in France or the Labour Party in England. Such centralization has never existed in the United States. Rather, various movements, loosely allied to each other, have and still form what is known in the USA as the left, the underground, alternative society. Decentralization, it, its best and worst, the real American melting pot. The platforms of both feminism and of free love are still part of this melting pot. In Box, if Boxcar Bertha's autobiography is a, two, a story of hobos, it is also a story of women, especially of lower class women, and of women who do not wish to be bourgeois. I found that a great army of women had taken to the road young women mostly, gay, gallant, sure that their sex would win them away about far to discontented to settle down in one play in any one place. Their stories were very much the same. No work, a whole family on relief, no prospects of marriage, the, the need of a lark, the need for freedom of sex and of living, and the great urge to know what other women were doing. When Bertha, still a child, meets a woman hobo for the first time, she, Bertha, loses a virginity. The woman hobo represents freedom to this child. 
I saw her flip a freight that had stopped at our switch to take on an empty and ride the rods right out of our camp, waving to mother in our doorway and the gang who held up their shovels in astonishment. She had a book along. She had been in Detroit. She spoke of a child in Memphis. She was going to talk at an International Workers of the World meeting on the coast. Books plus travel plus free sexual choice plus hatred of capitalism are the fairy tale formula for this child. But the looks on her face when she talked about going west and the sureness with which she swung under the freight car set my childish mind in fever. The world was easy like that, even to women. It had never occurred to me before. Feminism equals free love, or does it? For the child, a woman is anyone but victim. Boxcar begins to question the free love freedom equation when she meets her father, Walker C. Smith, for the first time. Walker C. Smith runs a small radical bookstore in New York City and is an anarchist both politically and personally. When Boxcar asks him how he feels about having abandoned her when she was a child, he replies that all men are her fathers and brothers, and all children her sons and daughters. Agree, I agreed, Boxcar said cathartically, with so much that my father said, yet he and his thoughts and the way he lived left me feeling confused and helpless. I could not accept his complete lack of responsibility towards his women and his offspring, or his complete impersonality. Owed to our fathers with full knowledge that the time of their political and social control is almost over. I recently met a poet quite a bit older than me, whose writings I have read for many years. We fell in love, well, I did. I learned that he's married and has several other girlfriends. At the same time, he was directly affectionate to me to the point of strong emotion. I said to me that it is easy for some people to touch and to be touched. Perhaps this association has something to do with responsibility, that is, with the lack of it. What is felt at one moment has nothing to do with what is felt the next moment or any other moment. Lack of memory, disassociation almost in time, of moment from moment, those who control own, rule, control best when they don't sympathize, when they disassociate. What would happen if President Reagan empathized with the Chicanos in Los Angeles, or if he remembered his left-wing past? Boxcar was serious, was curious. She wanted to learn about other people. She learned through a sort of dangerous journalism by doing what those people, women, about whom she was interested, did. At a certain point, she became a whore. I'm going to learn why women let their feelings make slaves of them. Before she became a whore, Bertha said that she had noted that women hobos considered their own bodies their working capital. The same could be and has been said about women who marry. Only attributes such as class and money in this case come into consideration. Though the hookers Bertha first meets make good money, they're always broke, for this money goes from a man, the John, to a man, the pimp. The whore, the woman, is a conduit for money, not because of what she does. Fucking doesn't equal female degra degradation, despite the allegations of the moral majority. This woman is a conduit because our society is sexist, because our society has separated physical sex and feeling. Money is both the symbol and the reality of our disassociation. The answer to the question, why do women whore, is on the whole, in order to survive. Survive economically. But most whores give their money to pimps. Bertha didn't ask why women whore. She asked why they gave their money to pimps. This question is equivalent to the question, why do women agree to and even aggravate their own victimization? This answer has to be answered if women are to do more than just provide, or just survive. 
Marie gives her money to a pimp because she likes to quote wake up in the morning with someone who has low who is lower than she was. End quote. Lorraine's pimp protects her. The world, a male controlled world, is out to get her, arrest her, make her sick, beat her up. This one man protects her by taking her money. Spirals of victimization swirl around and into each other. Though she knows that pimps are scum, Boxcar has to know to do, so she takes on a pimp, Bill, an apt pawn. Her attraction to Bill seems to come partly from curiosity and very strongly out of sexual satisfaction. But this attraction turns into repulsion as soon as she realizes that Bill doesn't love her, isn't her man. So she says to Bill, I wonder why pimps with so much charm and power to thrill women use it only to degrade them and themselves. On the left and on the right and in the middle and everywhere, men have used women's sexualities and sexual needs and desires in order to control women. For until recently, a woman's work was her sexuality, motherhood or prostitution. Though, for women, work equaled sexuality and almost identity, female work was regarded as second rate, for instance, housework, and female sexuality regarded as the opposite of virginal, vicious, and evil. One result of this historical situation is that heterosexual women find themselves in a double bind. If they want to fight sexism, they must deny their own sexualities. At the same time, Feminism cannot be about the denial of any female sexuality. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. But like Marguerite de Ross's Lowell Stein in The Lack of Self, or like Boxcar, keep on traveling, girl. In Living My Life, her autobiography, Emma Goldman tells how when she was 15 years old in St. Petersburg, she met a clerk. He courted her for several months. One day he asked her to the hotel in which he was working. There he grabbed her and raped her. Strange, I felt no shame, only a great shock at the discovery that the contact between men and women could be so brutal and so painful. I walked out in a daze, bruised in every nerve. I have always felt, Goldman continued, between two fires in the presence of men, the lure remained strong, but it was always mingled with violent revulsion. Source was Living My Life, Dover Incorporated, 1970, page 23. At another point in her autobiography, Goldman describes her meeting with a brewer from Cincinnati. The unnamed man tells Emma that he's heard that she's the greatest champion of free love in the United States. Since he, too, believes in free love, would she please make love with him? Although he's married with man with grown children, he knows she believes in free love. This respectable pillar of society, Goldman muses, to whom free love is only a means for clandestine affairs, a sense of futility came over me and of dismal isolation. Living My Life, page 197. Both Boxcar and Goldman recognized that men control women partly through their sexualities, and both loved men sexually. Free love, for both women, was a complicated matter. Free love, or more aptly, free sexual choice, meant that women could control their own bodies, emotions, thoughts, and lives, and could choose freely sexually without being damaged beyond the wear and tear in the sexual arena. In a society which was and is still both sexist and capitalist, or post-capitalist, both Bertha and Goldman thought that it difficult for a woman to choose and control her life, but not impossible. When women have started to focus on sex as central to the oppression of women, there are two things they wanted. One was to be able to say no to sex, and the other was to be able to say free, to say yes to sex. Both were of those strains. 
Now, I think, those two branches of feminist thinking about sex have in some ways split off into different hardened positions within feminism, and one is associated with women against pornography movement. The other side, this is what I'll call the liberationist position, which wants to free women to explore our own sexuality, which has been so repressed and so male-defined. Schulman, Alex Kate, in an interview, Rolling Stock, number 10, 1985. This sexual bind, which both Bertha and Goldman recognized, is still one of the major definers of women's lives. In terms of this bind, the complexities of understanding of women's lives found in Boxcar Bertha and Autobiography renegotiate the schism between feminists who have interiorized the virgin of patriarchal religion and society into their own beliefs and those feminists who refuse to comprehend that sexuality because of sexism is a problem for most women. Consider Western patriarchal religion one last time. There are seven Christian sins, pride, anger, envy, avarice, sloth, gluttony, and lust. I do believe I've listed them correctly. What are the sins of our high political leaders? Overwhelmingly, their collective sin is a lack of sympathy, an inability to empathize. Lack of sympathy is ignorance, where is ignorance in the Christian negative pantheon? Boxcar Bertha felt for other humans to the extent that she had to know them, become them, a whore, homeless, willing to suffer, to learn. Such knowledge, such human knowledge, is complex. This introduction is for my friend Melissa, Kathy Acker.